Hello everyone. Welcome to my lecture for Mobile Matter. My name is Bea Legaspi. I'm a debater from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and I'll be delivering a lecture on understanding political actors. So just to give a very brief background on me, I am a debater. So my primary experience in debates have been in the British parliamentary and the Asian parliamentary format for UP Diliman. So that's probably what I'm going to assume most of you who are watching are most familiar with. I'm not going to go over the basics of these because there are a lot of other lecturers that are very good at this. So I do assume that you have some basic understanding of how motions are worded, or at least some experience within either of these formats. As for myself, outside of the bit, I'm a political science major. So some of these I will be borrowing from my experience in political science. I will flag, of course, to not use this material as a substitute for political science. This is not a political science lecture by itself, but rather this is about applying po political concepts to debating. And it just so happens it's easier to do this under the framework of how I've understood political science. So again, I'm not a graduated political science major. I may also not have the most accurate understanding of things. So hopefully you're able to augment this with additional things. Um, what I say may not also be always applicable to your experiences, may not always be applicable to what you most know, but I hope they still generally are helpful in being able to understand political actors or explaining how I understand political motions. So here's what we'll do over the course of the next few minutes. We'll first go over definitions of politics. Then we'll unpack actor incentives, explaining how exactly people choose to do things that they want to do, especially under the context of politics. And lastly, we'll frame polit political motions or motions around politics. Given my personal opinion is that there is no singular motion that is only about politics. But rather, most motions, if not all of them, involve a level of politics. Of course, a crucial thing of note is to ask first what exactly is politics. I put here that it's a contested concept. And I think for most political science majors who are also going to be watching this or who will have a uh, at least taken a political science class, it is indeed a contested concept in that political scholars are not always in agreement of how to define it. So what I always tell people is, if political scholars cannot agree on what exactly the definition of politics is, or have a working definition of it, depending on what ideology you lean towards, or what school of thought you are studying, or what you were taught, then it's incredibly hard as well for debaters to conceive of politics agree on politics within the scope of seven minute speeches or eight minute speeches in the Australasian format. And so the definition of politics is constantly negotiated both within debates and outside of debates. The working definition that people generally have of politics is it's a social activity where potentially people are discussing different aspects of political and social life or socialization and like the way that political systems are arranged. Um, there are four ways to define politics that I think may be helpful, both in understanding it more on a personal level, but also understanding how debates around politics can do. So this is a part where it's more theoretical, and I think it's helpful as we go over the course of the rest of the lecture, because you'll be able to understand concepts or approaches to politics and potentially understand how your teammates or how other people in the round may be viewing politics. When you are able to identify, ah, this is how they're viewing politics, how they're defining politics, it's a lot easier for you, therefore, to be able to reconcile these things, to be able to weigh out which one is more applicable to the, which motion or not. So there probably are a lot more other ways to define politics, but I just used the four major definitions that I was able to learn from Andrew Haywood, which is the author of the book that we used for political science uh, 11 or the introduction to it. The first is the definition of politics as government. So generally, a lot of people view politics to be defined by a state, right? So the there's a huge like branch of political science contested also if there's a branch, but generally like public administration, right? You assess the ways that governments work, the bureaucracy within governments. And so you can define politics as primarily based off of who gets elected, who is within government seats, who is the president, who's the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary, as well as like, what is the process of working within it? Um, 
And that's one way to conceive of politics. I think that's a very traditional, very narrow way of conceiving of politics because you're defining it as for so long as they are in government that is political, as long as it is outside of government, it is not political. So in under the scope of the definition of politics, for example, if I am protesting, but I'm not part of government, like I am just saying, oh, like I think that women should probably be able to question the binary of gender, but not directly questioning it within the structure of government, then it would not be seen as political because it is not something that you define as political. You define primarily what is political as the institution of government. And so that's what I say when it's narrow. You are delineating specifically that what politics ought to be is within the scope of the state, within the scope of its functional institutions. If you are not part of government, if you are part of civil society, you are not viewed as part of what political system is or what politics is defined as. Um, I think you may view some debates to be applicable to this and that potentially asking what are people working in government allowed to do or not do? What is the structure of political institutions, what they ought to be? But I think this is one way to conceive of it. Um, you may also find that a lot of these things align somewhat with ideologies. So perhaps ideologies in political science that go over government being smaller, pursuing smaller governments, etc., generally want to define politics as government because they don't view things like, for example, binaries of gender to be applicable to politics for so long as it is outside of the government. That may be helpful as well in understanding how people might view politics because there definitely are people who view politics as government. As I said, perhaps a more traditional version of it, perhaps an narrower scope of it, but people indeed define it to be that because generally some people say, for example, right, they have no room to think of politics or no room to interact with politics because it's for people who are part of government only. They do not have the space to think of that emotionally, mentally, and physically because they constantly are busy, etc. These are things that you may also want to assess when approaching actors because you also want to ask how exactly do they conceive of politics? Why exactly is the way it is? And I think for a lot of the time, you often argue that it potentially is because they have other things that they want to prioritize and therefore make the delineation of politics therefore. The second definition of politics is politics is conflict or solution or just generally conflict and compromise. So this is a slightly more expansive definition of politics. There is a general assumption that when you are pursuing a political resolution, you're not doing a military resolution. This is a very word-based um, definition, but, but that's just one way to demonstrate it. When people are saying, oh, we're trying to find a political solution, we're trying to find a democratic solution, what generally they assume is that politics itself is a platform for people to negotiate and speak. So most people, for example, conceive of politics as a platform to discuss, platform to negotiate differences in interest. Um, and that may work within the same way governments, for example, when you have hearings within the Senate or Congress, they are negotiating the different self-interests. When you are within civil society and you're working within different non-government organizations, for example, as I mentioned earlier, potentially a feminist organization working within a structure where they also have to work with potentially people on the opposite side of the bench, i.e. more conservative political leanings, that may be something that is still political because you are operating and negotiating, trying to find a political resolution. Um, same goes potentially through IR. The United Nations, for example, famously is created to avoid the conflict uh, of World War III because it was created post-World War II. Um, and, and so you may view politics to be itself an avoidance of conflict, but it can also be conflict in that politics is utilized by states to be able to negotiate conflict. For example, when you have a lot of international relations motions, you might always be familiar about how the U.S. and China may be in opposition with each other, how big groups such as the United Nations, the EU are likely to work together or work against each other. These are things that also are defined as political under this definition. So proponents of this idea or the, this particular definition will view politics to be a means to an end rather than a delineation between a something that is 
within government or something that is outside of government, unlike the previous definition. So politics is conflict or resolution and compromise generally is about the activity of being able to find or seek a resolution. As I said, it's about the ends, or rather, it's about the means to an end, not so much about the distinctions between this type of government or not. And I think it's a slightly more expansive one relative to the previous one. The third one is politics is power. And generally, this is about the distribution of power. What is power? And I think this is a more economic assessment of politics, right? So this is a lot more expansive as well because it's no longer just about the activity or the exercise of resolving who is going to get what or rather who is going to get their way. But now it is a question of how exactly is power distributed? So in economics, the basic definition of economics is it's a study of being able to assess how to divide limited resources across unlimited human human wants and needs. And it's very similar in the way that politics is, right? Because what you're distributing, you're distributing is limited amount of power across an unlimited group of people who are in need and want that level of power. And so politics as power is a question of what are the power dynamics within society? And so what this becomes is more of a personal and societal question and it's incredibly expansive here because as you may know for example a very massive or very common feminist slogan is the idea of what is personal is political um, and that already defines the way politics is seen as power because for example feminists historically have said or at least a portion of feminists have said that a lot of the social and political dynamics at home are indeed political as well for example, when women speak about how they do more domestic work relative to men, about how a lot of these uh, individual gender binaries also affect you at home in a personal capacity because there are still power dynamics that affect you, or even more Marxist ideas about how power, there's a superstructure that defines a structure or th that defines a power in which people are all all allocated because on the basis of their socioeconomic status. These things are part of power dynamics that now you define as part of political or, or what is political. So under this definition, politics is everything because you might observe that power is everywhere and integrated into most social dynamics and social situations. So under this, it is no longer just defined as everything that is in a particular government defined only by institutions or formal institutions rather, no longer defined by just the means towards negotiating, but is entrenched into any lived reality, any exercise that you may have. And this is a more... Um, as I said, I think I associate this personally more with more feminist ideologies. I absolutely know there are other ways that this is applicable. But the expansion of what is political, um, of course, aligns as well with ideologies that view politics to be something that is corrective, which historically has been seen as like not political, i.e. like, you know, wanting to liberate minority groups, for example, because now you view these to be as political as opposed to before, not viewing these to be as crucial or as important. The last definition of politics is politics is a public and social activity. Um, and so the difference here is it's also slightly more limiting um, in that politics is a public and social activity means that there is still something that is not political, i.e. you are defining something to be public and private. So the difference here between the first definition of it as government is you want to assess politics under this scope as something that affects people in the public sphere. You are creating a division between what is public and private. That also is a distinction between it and power because it and power means if you view everything to be a power dynamic, then obviously the person is political. Here you make a distinction still, but not as limiting as a government. You are now including social society, civil society, non-government organizations in it. For so long, as it is something that is called a public interest for people, it is political. But if it is private, for example, if you are writing in your diary, um, your experiences within your family, for, because these are still things that are personal or whatever, these would not be considered as political. The, the, the difference between this and the second definition is the second definition is about the activity of it. This very similarly to the second one, uh, rather to the first definition is about cre creation of a delineation. But again, the difference here between the first and the fourth one is about the scope of people it affects. The most crucial thing you want to assess from this is when you define it as a public interest, you also have to ask what exactly is public interest, who construes these public interests 
what is the line between that and what is personal? Because it's a lot murkier than, say, the first and the third definition. And so debates based off of public activity have to always ask, what exactly is public? Who comprises the public? And I think these are questions that are crucial as well because they involve a lot more people than government, involve potentially less people than power dynamics. But often it is what most people view politics, right? In the average way. Um, at least in my experience, the way most people conceive of politics is it might not just be only government, but it might also not just be something that is everything, but it might be something that is a personal or rather a public and social activity when you have social interactions with other people. And so the def this particular definition of politics, I think, is an important way to assess things like the social contract, things like assessing the ways that people interact with states or non-formal institutions. So those are the four ways you can conceive of politics. Um, and the reason why I think it's very crucial for us to understand different definitions of politics is A, you want to be able to theorize what politics is for you to actually be able to debate it. When you encounter motions, which we'll discuss later, potentially motions that you may see, it's very important for you to assess what scope of defining politics will be most strategic in utilizing this. What ways will teams define politics? It's not new to you that even outside of politics, teams define arguments differently. An affirmative slash government slash proposition team will likely define the debate slightly differently than the opposing negative team. Um, and that's normal. Ideally, you want to be able to resolve it because for the judge to be able to compare both of these arguments, they have to be defined on a similar spectrum. Now, you want to be able to ensure that if you have opposing definitions of politics, A, you are proving why your definition is better, B, you interact with their definition, and C, you reconcile both of these, which one is a more important or more applicable definition in the context of the debate you are having. So that's one way that it's important. Theorizing is important because you want to be able to apply it later on to the ideas you have, but you're not going to be able to apply it or reconcile it if you are unaware of how teams are defining politics or the underlying assumptions the teams make. Second reason for why it's important. You want to be able to mechanize things. So it's very important to define politics because how you're able to mechanize or what priorities you have in mechanizing your arguments relies on what is most crucial. When you go approach a particular motion and think, ah, okay, what's important here is we have defined the principle of politics being personal, then you want to prioritize explaining why the politics is indeed personal as opposed to going in depth about what exactly government structures are or the opposite way as well. So you want to know what to prioritize in mechanization, and you'll primarily know that at a point where you define politics the best way, or at least the most optimal way. The last reason I think it's crucial is just allows you to also like matter load better or matter file better because you're able to understand what leanings are of different things when you're reading, but also conceive of potential motions that come out because you're able to view there are different questions, different debates. Even the definition of politics itself is a debate. Um, and so being able to assess these allow you to have a gut feel of these are motions that you might have to prepare for. These are ways in which you might prepare for things like majors, etc. So I think it's very, very crucial within round within the ways that you're able to improve as a debater and learn how to mechanize things better, but also in terms of you being able to protect yourselves or potentially prepare yourselves for motions and like the way that you absorb material. Let's go over, I think, a more interesting question of how exactly do people behave. So this is the part where we're going into how actors are going to be assessed. But before we go into all of that, the preliminary thing everyone should be doing is identifying who the actors are. So what I like to do or what I learned to do before I started even debating, and I think it's still applicable now, is you want to have a list of like a table, right? You want to have a table of like, okay, here's a list of people who are potentially affected, the stakeholders. These are the ways that they are going to be affected. And so I like doing that because I think it allows you to understand a bit more how people are affected. And this applies regardless of the motion. And I think most people, it helps as well to be able to conceive of debates as something that affects people the most, right? Even in a motion like econ, where you potentially, like me, struggle a lot with, it helps to be able to unpack, okay, the actor is first and foremost the state, the second is the people who are potentially upper class, the second is people who potentially are middle class, potentially lower class, the third is corporations, etc. 
it allows you to unpack it a bit more thoroughly. And I think that's generally very helpful. So before you jump into the rest of this lecture, or even the rest of political motions, or even just the rest of motions, what I recommend is an exercise of always asking yourself in prep and in motions, who are the people affected by these? Um, I think this is very, very crucial and important because I think that allows you, A, to impact your arguments better, but B, as well, allows you to be more holistic in assessing an argument when you are assessing, oh, this is the way it affects each, uh, this person. This is the way that this person might react. Um, so I just want to note that I think it's very very crucial. There are very good are there are very good lectures about how actors will likely behave that are on YouTube. Um, I think these are very very helpful before we go into the theories of how people would likely react politically. Um, for this part, I only limited it to two theories um, because I feel like these are the most common ways. Obviously, there are a lot more theories in how people are likely to behave and likely to react that I think is just very helpful in terms of us observing political phenomena within debate across the two. Um, theories that I explain. The first theory is rational choice theory. Um, and this might be something you are, you've heard of if you are um, in uh, econ and political science. But generally, rational choice theory just basically assumes that decisions made by individual actors will produce social behavior. And the way that people often do it is based off of their own self-interest. So it assumes two things. The first is that people have their own information and have complete and good information about society or about their choices and their what that secondarily means that they often probably have their own self-interest at heart when they're making their preferences. I obviously know that there are some struggles or issues with the rational choice theory and that people will obviously say, oh, yeah, but, you know, people don't have complete information. People are not always rational. That's right. But um, when we often do debates, right, we often assess an actor to be based off this, to be acting based on their self-interest or to be acting based on um, the information that they believe to be complete. Um, and so when you are applying rational choice theory in debates or assessing how actors will likely react based off of rational choice theory. What's important for you to assess is two things. The first is, what do they know? Um, I.e., if you are saying that a voter will act in a certain way, a politician will act in a certain way, you want to ask, right, like, what are the information available to them? How will they likely get this information? Um, and then the second is, what is their self-interest and how far is the outcome from their self-interest? Because their reaction and their behavior will likely be defined by how far it is from their self-interest. I.e., if, for example, a worker wants a particular salary and then you give them a very low salary relative to what their expectation is, then that difference defines their behavior as opposed to if it is exactly the same as what they asked for, where they would likely want to work more, where they'd likely be very um, engaged with the corporation. Um, if it's farther away, that's probably less likely. So that's just one way to explain how incentives operate. Now, people might be nudged towards a certain direction if you utilize a self-interest to work within it. For example, in the motion, this house would ban all political donations by corporations. You want to first ask the justification behind it, right? So obviously on either side, you want to ask what's the urgency. A government team or government speaker may argue that it is good to ban all political donations because in the absence of it, corporations will be able to utilize their own self-interest because they will just spend a lot of money in corp on governments. So they will just spend a lot of money on elections and they're able to get their own desires because governments all or politicians always want more money because probably in a charitable way, they want money to be able to fund government institutions that often is very, very low because of the way taxation operate often means that you often keep taxation rates low because um, rich people don't want to be taxed. Um, but in a less charitable way, you might say that politicians want money because they're corrupt. So corporations fulfill that need by giving them money, funneling money there. And then they get their own self-interest of being able to increase market share, being able to have monopolization because they are with uh, they are separated from government regulation. And so the promises they make are uh, reciprocal. And that means that based on rational choice theory, they're able to fulfill each other's self-interest. And that is something we do not want, right? Because it's not going to be optimal for the interests of society or the common good of society in which people probably shouldn't 
uh, be affected by corporations. Or, maybe you can say it's probably good that they are affected by corporations, probably fine. Political donations are very, very important, very good. That's for the self interest of people. That obviously differs on which side of the bench you are on. But generally, I think that's one way you can conceive of the justification for it. And that's also of a question in the absence of this policy or the self interest of different groups. So, we've already defined the self interest that they have. There's one way for you to approach it. Um, and say that the, these are the ways that corporations likely react absent the policy. With the policy, you can also say potentially if you ban all political donations, corporations will be quite frustrated or governments or politicians will be quite frustrated because they no longer are able to fulfill their own self-interest. So it's not only in explaining the premise that this is applicable, but you can also explain impacts based off of rational choice theory because you explain the ways that their self-interest is changed. Or in the case, as I pointed out, when the self-interest that they have is different from the actual reality. That margin changes the way that they are likely to behave. And explaining how this behavior manifests explains a lot of how you impact different things. Great. The second thing that we can discuss is about institutionalism. So institutionalism can refer in political science either to formal arrangements that define political activity, like institutions of political parties of governments, or to informal arrangements like trends and patterns of behavior within political systems, e.g. social norms. So the difference or the distinction between the two is a formal arrangement is something that is codified, right? So you have governments that are bound by constitutions, you have Supreme Courts that are actually codified as something with power. Political parties are formalized, they have registration systems, etc. An informal arrangement is something that is less permanent, but is still an expectation or is still something that people are beholden to. So these are distinct institutions. Um, and both of them can define the way we act. Because for example, if you are part of a political party, you are expected to act in line with the political party. If you are part of the Supreme Court, there are certain expectations within that institution that is formal, right? That, for example, if you are part of a Supreme Court, you're a Supreme Court justice, you probably are bound um, to be impartial with the way that you are assessing things, even if you are appointed by a particular president. Um, in a similar way, informal arrangements are far less codified in the sense that they actually probably are not. Um, but there are social norms. In Philippines, for example, we have the idea of utang na loob, which is just reciprocal obligation in English. Um, and these are things that are informal because no one really codifies it. But generally, it is an expectation that if you are appointed to a certain position, you become a pro whoever appointed you in that position. Um, and these are expectations within you. Same goes, for example, towards kinship behavior. Like, for example, if a politician provides a lot of ayuda or give or gift, for example, to a particular barangay or a small region in the Philippines, then oftentimes you will assume reciprocal obligation that you will vote for them. So institutions may be formal and informal, codified and uncodified, permanent and less permanent. But generally, they affect the way that we behave because these are the either things that we are grew up in or we are punished if we do not fall in line with the institutions. Now, the way that we can assess them in debates is we have a lot of debates about both informal and formal ones. We'll, we'll first go over formal institutions. So in the motion, this House believes that the Democrats should back the Supreme Court. You first want to ask what exactly does packing mean? In this debate, packing the Supreme Court means that you are adding more individuals if you have the position to be able to um, appoint justices in the Supreme Court, then you are appointing justices that in, are in line with your political behavior um, to ensure that it's always going to be a majority pro-Democrat um, Supreme Court. And so there's a lot of institutions here, right? The Democratic National Committee the or the DNC and the Supreme Court, as well as the way in which this would likely happen, the ways people would likely react, especially the Republicans. So how you want to assess it is the institution formally of the Supreme Court, will it be destroyed? What exactly is the institution or what exactly is the point firstly of the Supreme Court and the judiciary as a whole, right? And that's the first question you want to make. What is the point of these formal institutions? How does this change the formal institution? Does it make it less fair? Does it correct for something that is unfair? Is fairness even an important mechanism here? The last thing you want to ask, or at least one of the questions you want to ask is, 
in the instant, how does it interact potentially with other institutions? And how does it change the behavior people have? So when you pack the Supreme Court, will it likely mean that people will fall in line with Democrats? I, I suppose you can, all, while I put this under formal institutions, I think you ob- absolutely can also argue in formal institutions here how there will be reciprocal obligation expected, how it will change the ways people view the government, how that will change the way people expect government to behave, how potentially it will create a new trend, a new precedent, for example, for the Republicans to be also pack the Supreme Court when a Democrat inevitably fail um, or inevitably like lose um, the presidency or something similar to that. So I think you want to ask, how does it affect future trends, but also how does it affect the current, situ- current institutions that are formalized within government? The second motion we can assess is this has to get the glorification of compromise politics in Western liberal democracies. And this becomes a lot more of a trend slash norm question of institutions. So you want to ask, how does the glorification interact with the norms existing within politics, right? So glorification debates are very um, interesting <laughs> um, in that oftentimes there are very different ways that teams define them. And I think this motion in particular is really interesting because the glorification of it is interesting in different levels. So compromise politics is generally the assumption that, you know, you don't want to just completely oppose people you want to want to compromise you want to engage with them um and so teams can argue that well compromise politics has been bad because at a point where people move towards the extremes you will often shift the overton window towards that angle but also people generally potentially dilute political ideology and political parties on the opposite side you might say compromise politics is necessary otherwise you will have political gridlocks um governments that are less willing to work together a government or a state as a whole that is divided um and so when you are assessing these things, you want to ask, how did these norms start? Where do these norms come from? That major question is very, very crucial. And then as you move into it, how does that interact with other existing norms and the expectations of democracy, existing norms and the expectations of how you engage and work together? Um, so as well, most crucially, how does it change expectations from politicians? Because when you have the glorification, you create a trend of compromise politics. And that means that politicians are beholden to this. Governments are beholden to this. Other political actors like corporations, social groups, civil society are beholden to this. So you want to assess how exactly they are defined and affected by these and how that changed political outcomes. So that is the way you want to apply um, new institutionalism or institutionalism that is defined by trends and social norms. So the important thing I want to note here across these two theories is you want to contextualize the actor's self-interest. You want to know what the self-interest is by unpacking exactly who are they likely to be. So most times you want to assess them, okay, if it's Donald Trump, then it's Donald Trump. That is the potential self-interest he has. He's a Republican. He potentially is a corp- uh, very he's a corporate mogul. So he probably cares a lot about profit or probably cares about his brand and institution. Probably also cares about his own, like saving his own um, self from a lot of litigation that is coming out. And so you might be wanting to contextualize these as well behind like what are his self-interests and then later on how the institutions surrounding him exist, right? So the Republican party, how institutions around him within the Republican party support a lot of his self-interest or why he's likely to react in certain ways, even if he may not believe in certain behaviors. Similar things go to like, for example, if you're uh, contextualizing, say, the self-interest of letting your brother in the Philippines, you want to assess, okay, maybe she potentially cares about um, the Liberal Party because she was once associated with them, probably cares about opposing Duterte because she is the leader of the opposition, but probably also cares about being able to just generally be part of civil society and help. That's why she created Angat Buhay, for example, which is a non-government organization. But you also want to contextualize it in the uh, institution that she is in. Like, for example, she was vice president in an institution which was quite hostile to a vice president, given that the rest of the presidency, the executive function was primarily um appointed by Duterte, who was a president that she was opposing, but also like norms within it, the assumptions that she is going to have reciprocal obligations, etc. How do people view her based off of that? How, how does she interact with the populist narratives that Duterte has created, the norms of Duterte? Um, that may be helpful. And that's good because once you're able to create a distinction between these things, that allows you to understand a bit better how different political actors behave or why they're likely to behave in certain ways. Both important in creating premises, but also important in creating impacts in general for debates. So hopefully that's clear in terms of how potentially these are things that can be quite helpful for how you're able to assess different actors. Now we can move on to the last part of this lecture, which is just to ask, how do we apply these then to 
politics motions. Um, but I will push back against the idea that there's just a politics motions. I just think that almost every motion includes politics in it. Be it this house as Messi regrets leaving Barcelona. I think there is some way as well for you to angle politics there. Be it an econ motion like this house believes that high, uh, this house believes that um, mega cities should be discouraged by governments. There is absolutely an, a political angle there. Or even just generally motions like art or anything else. Because I think that politics can be integrated in a lot of the ways that we assess it based off the definition of politics as power. But regardless, again, as I said, it's dependent on how you define politics. We'll go over broadly a few sets of motions that I think may be helpful in distinguishing how politics motions are and how to approach them. The first is, should X have politics in it? So a lot of debates often refer to discussions about like, oh, uh, should corporations have politics? Should pop culture have politics? Or even art and sports? And the way you want to approach it, these are going back to the definition of the politics as power. Depending on your side, of course, you might want to say oh, it's only about public spaces or, oh, it's about power or, oh, it's about governments only. Um, how you want to define these often is, A, to define what exactly the thing that is not, that is being questioned is. So if it's about corporations, what exactly the structure of corporations are they compatible with politics? Um, and then secondly, defining politics. You want to explain what politics is based on the things that we explained earlier. And then you want to go into like the behaviors people have. How will people likely behave in the absence or presence of politics? Are these outcomes good or not? Going back to rational choice and institutionalism. Um, and as well, like obviously the norms that they have, the formal institutions that are part of it, as well as what their self-interest is. So those are the steps in which I would say you can reconcile these. In most cases, AF or government will just say, well, they should have politics that's just good because it allows for good democratization representation up will say oh there are alternatives to representation um it shouldn't have politics because it's probably one way for you to be able to ensure people are able to subscribe to it or they are isolated from a lot of political discussions that often allows people to either be very very divided or people just tune out of it because they don't really want to have or discuss politics because they have a negative conception of it um and these arguments are fair. I'm sure there are a lot more other arguments depending on the nuance of it. But what you want to be able to do is reconcile them based off of the things that we mentioned earlier. When you know that it is a debate about should X have politics in it, the question is not about the specifically like many different ways of how you conceive of like democracy or autocracies or whatever, but it's about specifically the compatibility of politics and X. So you want to specifically prioritize the characterization of how these two things happen. For example, this house believes that university council representatives should not take vocal positions on national politics. So if you dilute it, there's a question of should schools be engaged in politics? Should school representatives in universities be engaged in politics to a point of vocal positioning? Um, and so how you want to assess it is not to go into, oh, the democracy is this or that, but you want to assess what exactly are university council representatives? How exactly does it mean to have vocal positions on national politics? How will that affect both them individually affect the universities they represent, the people and constituents that voted them in, as well as generally the perception people have of politics. So the clashes there here are not particularly based off like political theory necessarily, but are based instead of how people are likely to react or likely to behave, um, specifically people within the group of X. Same goes to this other motion. This house supports the politicization of the Met Gala. So the Met Gala, if you're unaware, is, um, I believe, uh, an event yearly that celebrates the Met, which is the museum. Um, and the Met Gala is very, very popular. You see a lot of like fashion looks from a lot of celebrities here. It's primarily used as a, I believe, a fundraising for the Met. Um, and so the question here is like, is it good that we are politicizing it in terms of the way people wear dresses, the way people protest. Um, I'm sure there have been some protests before. Uh, I think Cara Delevingne, for example, notably created a dress or something that um, protested against social inequality. Um, that was also itself a very divisive thing, I believe. Some people made fun of her in that it seemed quite tokenistic. Some people were turned off by it because they indeed felt like it was not a space for it. Some people were appreciative of it because they felt it was crucial. It's a full debate. Um, and so this debate is therefore a question of 
should art be politicized, specifically the Met Gala. And the way that you're able to take wins here is by being able to say that art itself indeed ought to be political, but specifically the Met Gala because of the ways it is structured. Potentially, you can argue the Met Gala is historically very, very elitist. And that is why it's very crucial, particularly the Met Gala, to be very political. Because that space in particular should be something that people are able to speak out against. Be- people have a platform to be able to protest. Um, on the opposite side, you might say, well, the politicization of Met Gala is likely to be very, very tokenistic, as I mentioned. It might be something that is not very in tune with what politics actually is, and therefore is providing a platform to something that may not be super accurate. The way that you're able to resolve it is a question of who exactly is involved in the Met Gala, who exactly is involved in X. And so at the point where you understand who X is when you are assessing these motions, the question therefore is the compatibility of these things. Second type of motion is how could, should power be really dispersed? So when actors have conflicting self-interest, place they place pressure on each other. So you want to look at the power of those actors, how they're likely to be assessed. So generally, as I mentioned, politics is power is also looking at power dynamics. And when you're looking at power dynamics, self-interest, these are things that often are conflicting with each other. So what you want to assess is how are these things prioritized? Which one you, should you prioritize? Um, for example, in this motion, this House believes that labor unions should primarily pursue legislative change as a means of achieving workers' rights, as opposed to, or instead of directly negotiating with companies, you're creating a question of prioritization, right? So I'm not saying that these is completely distinct from the idea of like, should it be part of politics? Because I, but, but under the assumption here, you already assume that on either side, they want labor unions to be political because they're working with each other or working towards companies. You're trying to negotiate either through legislative change or directly negotiating with companies. But the question is, whose power do you provide for, right? Because if you're prioritizing legislative change, that is quite different from directly negotiating with companies because there's a different group of people you're negotiating with. So on the affirmative or government side, when you are pursuing legislative change, the primary power is placed on labor unions moving and working towards politicians and lawmakers if you are working and negotiating with companies the power is placed primarily within companies and insular spaces as opposed to more probably widespread things because they are legislative they are more uh, the definition of a law is that obviously it applies in larger scope it's probably uh, might be more than just one particular corporation as opposed to if you are negotiating directly with corporations and companies it's probably more insular in that it's individual companies so it's a question of how do you disperse the power that you do have as a labor union? I would say, I think a lot of social movements motions fall into this general idea that you want to question in a limited capacity of a social movement of a labor union or of a political organization that historically is um, misrepresented, underrepresented, or, or generally just disprivileged. How are you able to utilize the pr- power and prioritization? And so this is, I think, a question of how you're able to disperse that power. Which actor is more crucial and important? Which actor, when you're negotiating with them, has more outcomes that you can deliver? So I think it's a really important question about both which one you ought to prioritize based on vulnerability or larger scope, or secondarily, which one is potentially more long-term, potentially more prior- more permanent, uh, as well as like which one is more likely to actually get outcomes. So question of prioritization for the individual and prioritization based off of which outcomes are more likely. Another type of motion I think may be applicable here that is outside of the scope of social movements motion is the South would make Serbia's membership to the EU conditional on condemning Russian military operations in Ukraine. And I think this is a really interesting motion as well because it's a question of like power dispersion as well. Because it's about the EU using its power against Serbia. So I want to go back to the self-interest question here, right? The self-interest of Serbia is they potentially want to be part of the EU because they're applying to the EU. But they also don't want to completely condemn Russia because they're relatively culturally close to Russia and politically close to Russia. Um, Russia's self-interest is obviously still have some power over Ukraine and to still project a lot of political power. Um, in general, relative to the EU and NATO. The EU's obvious political incentive is to oppose Russia. So these are a confluence of different self-interest and different priorities. What you want to do in this debate is you want to assess what is the optimal prioritization? Um, And probably you're going to piss off some actors here, right? Because if you make Serbia's membership conditional, Serbia might be pissed off. Russia might be pissed off if Serbia therefore condemns them. On the opposite side, the EU might be pissed off. You want to assess these different actors, what they provide to different groups, 
which groups are more prioritized, i.e. going back to vulnerability, which outcomes are more likely, i.e. going back to our previous discussion about which one is more long-term, more permanent, or generally more likely to provide good outcomes at all. So I think that's very, very helpful in being able to conceive of motion types like these. I think these are helpful as well outside of uh, social movements so for IR motions. Because IR motions, you have very different negotiating powers, very different ideologies, very different interests. You being able to negotiate these, especially in very tense situations, like for example, Serbia, the EU, relationship there also a bit tense because of the Balkans, but also relationship with Russia, I think is very helpful in prioritizing which self-interest matters more. The last type of motion is, is insert political system the best one relative to all others? And this is a lot less pragmatic. So the past two are slightly more pragmatic, right? The first one is a mix of definitions being like principled and then a pragmatic outcome and then the second one is more pragmatic based in that you want to ask yourself is the self-interest more important obviously there's still a question of principle like is this something that's more vulnerable but this one is a very oftentimes a question of the phenomenon itself and often falls into like different outcomes or different con conceptions of what the world is because the previous ones what you rely on is a likelihood definition in these types of motions you want to assess motions based off of the best version of this political system and the worst version of political systems you can't get away by saying oh it's more likely to be this or that because you want to engage with both of them so often we have debates about democracies autocracies and generally different forms of political arrangements which political arrangement is most crucial more most important most applicable um, and the way you want to assess these types of motions are by being able to give a set of definitions for what a democracy, for example, is, what a dictatorship, for example, is. Example for this very, very classic motion, the South prefers a benevolent dictatorship over a weak democracy. How you go about political theory questions like these is to create a set of definitions first about what these two things are. A benevolent dictatorship is potentially some dictatorship that is indeed controlled by a singular government, indeed controlled by a singular individual, but benevolent in the sense that they are not actively killing them. Potentially, they are still limiting free speech, free press, but it is benevolent in the way that people are not actually being killed, have some level of economic development, some stability. A weak democracy potentially is a democracy that is post-conflict, and that's why there is potentially a problem within the way political arrangement works because people are not able to fully negotiate it and that's why it takes them a bit of a long time to be able to have an elections or potentially when they do have an elections it may be some level of opposition that exists so what happens here is you want to create those set of distinctions and then create the metric for is it fair is it good is it applicable to most people or is it beneficial to most people what is most applicable within the context of this particular group of actors so this is a question of like here are a set of things that define these, and then you want to create metrics for how to assess them because it's a lot more arbitrary or at least a lot more abstract how you want to compare or weigh these things. I usually think it's good to go to what how people are affected because I think that's the most concrete way. Um, people affected in terms of like, is it fair for them? Uh, are they hurt? Um, and, and you want to assess that in, in terms of how they are hurt, right? Like, do they get more benefic benefit with having like short-term economic stability as opposed to potentially like long-term not being able to transition back to democracy, etc. So that question goes back to like the principle, but also to the people. And I think it's a very important assessment of like political systems because you can't just define it to be, oh, all benevolent dictatorships are particularly like this one very, very, like very good example, say, for example, Singapore. May also be other examples, may also be other conceptions of it that you have to assess. A weak democracy may be the Philippines, yes, but may also be the like Ethiopia. Um, and so these are very different ideas of how to view it. And I think it's very important to cre create a key set of assumptions in terms of defining them. The same applies to the South Opposed Respectability Politics, which generally is very similar to what we discussed earlier about compromise politics. Um, but in this context, it's a question of the phenomenon itself. So you want to assess, is respectability politics really important, really the best way for people to arrange their lives, or are there better alternatives to it? Um, and so the way that you want to assess these types of emotions or you want to structure them around the question of when you define these phenomena, how are they affecting people's lives? Are they actually better or not? Um, and generally, that is what I'd say in terms of how political or uh, debates would go um, or how political motions would go. I hope this has been helpful. Um, I, and generally, I think what I want to end this on is just to explain that 
politics motions, I think, are oftentimes very intimidating because there's a lot of conceptual analysis that often people require. But I think at the end of it, these are things that are not new to you. These are things that you often go and experience on a day-to-day life, right? When you are voting for a politician, you are thinking about your self-interest, you're educating yourself and trying to get as much information as possible. When you are someone who is interacting with a social group protesting, you're assessing and questioning the different political and power dynamics within it because you're also questioning the phenomenon in your life oftentimes why am i not able to buy these things relative to this friend i have who may be able to afford it as well um or similarly as well why do i have less rights compared to someone who may be more uh privileged um and so a lot of these things define political conceptions i I think people oftentimes conceive of politics as very elitist form and structure which is absolutely very fair politics has been utilized by a lot of individuals for their own self-interest my opinion um but i also think it's a very accessible form of debate because these are things that are our lived realities at the end of it while there are different definitions and theories and conceptions of politics politics is based on our own personal experiences as humans and so it is probably something that you can resonate with the most regardless of what you know about it so in time or in cases where you are unable to understand fully or conceive of emotion. I think what's best here is to look in words and assess how does it affect people like me, how does it affect people like my teammates and the judge, an average reasonable voter. And that's how you're able to conceive of arguments that are able to work in a set of political motions that maybe you find yourself not able to fully understand. So hopefully that's clear. Uh, you can reach out to me. My name is Bea Legaspi on Facebook as well. Uh, thank you so, so much for allowing me this platform. I'm very, very um, excited to hear from people if you have any questions.